Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I feel like at some level I'm going to have to have a, a defense of evidence-based practice <laughs> after <afternoon>. today. <laughs> You know, and, and part of, I guess, what I'd say, the, the, the 30,000 foot uh, argument for evidence-based practice uh, is the argument about what is the alternative. Um, so would you want your provider to be practicing medicine based on their gut instincts? Um, what others have taught them that may or may not be based on, on evidence. So something to think about, and something that may come up in the uh, discussion section as well. I definitely, definitely welcome uh, uh, discussion on that topic. I, I thank Beth for uh, in, inviting me to speak here today. Beth uh, heard a presentation I gave at the Medical Library Association conference last year that was here in Chicago. Uh, where I talked a lot about our Center for Evidence-Based Practice at the University of Pennsylvania and how we're operating to attempt to integrate evidence into practice, not necessarily at the individual provider patient level, but uh, at the health system patient population level. So what I'm going to speak about today is a bit about our center, but I also want to talk about how uh, the initiatives and, and the activities in the center mesh well with um, the roles and responsibilities and accountabilities of healthcare librarians. Um, and hopefully that can, that can spark some discussion. Before I begin, I just wanted to get a, a, a feel uh, for all of you in the room. How many of you, uh, by a show of hands, are librarians? And how many of you uh, lead or, or work in a, a, um, a medical library that's part of a healthcare organization, like a hospital or a set of clinics? Okay. And for those of you who didn't raise your hands, uh, what other roles do we have out there? Academic Health Center. Academic Health Center, sure. State Library. State Library. All right, great. So I, I, I hope this will be relevant for, uh, for all of you in the room. There we go. So I'm going to start with a case. Uh, it's fun to start these discussions with cases. And, and this is a real life case. And so let's say uh, you have a prominent surgeon in your hospital. And this surgeon uh, wants to do the best that they can to prevent surgical site infections in their, in their patients. And so uh, they want to start stocking the operating room with uh, a newer agent uh, that they believe has, has better effectiveness at reducing the risk of surgical site infections. And that agent is called chlorhexidine. And it's $13 per patient. And that's compared to the older agent, Betadine. This is, that's the yellow <coughs> stuff that they, they spread on a site before they make an incision to uh, prevent a surgical site infection. <laughs> and that old school Betadine is about 60 cents per patient. So the question is, how, how is the decision made about what product is stocked in the operating room for the surgeon to use? So this data that I'm presenting here is actually a bit old. It's from the early 90s. But many people would argue that um, uh, the, the data is not uh, incredibly different nowadays. And what this table is showing, it's showing a collection of about 12 medical centers that were part of a research consortium. Uh, and these 12 medical centers uh, were administered a survey about how the institutions make decisions about what supplies and what technologies to invest in and purchase for their healthcare systems. And what you'll see here, first of all, is that most of these uh, medical centers or academic centers, uh, arguably some of the best in the country, um, most of them are saying that they're making these decisions in political, informal, or ad hoc ways. So for example, if you have a surgeon who's a rainmaker for the hospital, they bring in a, a large profit margin. Maybe what they want is taken into account more than somebody who's, 
who's working um, in a uh, clinical area that, that brings in less, less margin. Also, very few of these institutions at the time had standing committees to actually evaluate technologies that they wanted to invest in. And the same survey asked about what characteristics of a technology, whether it was a device, a drug, a supply, uh, were um, decision makers looking at to make decisions about purchases and investments. And you see that many of them are looking at the, the efficacy or effectiveness of the intervention. That's a good thing. But all of them are looking at cost. So for the most part, these are informal decisions that are being made ad hoc, mostly based on how expensive a technology is and not necessarily how effective it is. So there's, there's a way to, to change this scenario to, to result in better health outcomes for our patients. And that's what I want to speak a bit to. So I think everyone in this room has seen uh, these infamous or famous IOM reports. Um, for a long time, I thought these were the only IOM reports that were ever published, which <laughs> for all of you who have gone to the IOM uh, website, you know that they publish tens of reports a year. So. Uh, but to Ares Human, clearly uh, established the patient safety movement. Um, uh, they had the narrative in this report that uh, the number of patients dying in hospitals from safety errors a year <coughs> were about 100,000 or equivalent to a, a 747 falling out of the sky every day. So it, it caught a lot of people's attention. And the follow-up uh, to that report was crossing the quality chasm, which did for the patient care quality movement what, what to Eris Human did for the safety movement. More recently, and arguably less well known uh, for those outside of the field, is a series of reports that started uh, with this initial report in 2007 called the Learning Healthcare System, where the IOM talked about uh, the potential of healthcare systems uh, to use uh, research evidence and, and their own data, particularly data in electronic health records, uh, the available big data, uh, to understand uh, um, and improve their processes and improve the care of the, the patients that they're serving. And the opening quote of this report, uh, I like quite a bit. It's, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. And this really uh, highlights uh, the reality that Oftentimes, our scientific understanding outpaces uh, what we're doing in the real world in terms of patient care. Um, and it's this implementation gap um, uh, that, that's often um, uh, described as a quality gap. We, we know that something um, uh, should be done a certain way to result in the best outcomes, but it's ju that's just not happening in the majority of circumstances. So how could we improve the gap between what we know works and what we actually practice at the bedside? Uh, oftentimes this is called the knowing-doing gap. We don't do what we know is right. So there are, there are processes in place uh, to help systems, including hospital systems and healthcare systems, integrate evidence uh, into practice to improve care. This is one cycle uh, that has gotten a lot of attention recently. It's called the knowledge to action cycle. And it's really a compilation of about 30 different frameworks that have been used over the decades to integrate evidence into practice. And some of those frameworks are ones that are very well known by nursing faculty, the Iowa model, the Hopkins model. Um, so this knowledge to action cycle at some level is an update, uh, one of the more recent uh, updated models. And it looks a bit complex, but I'll, I'll walk you through it um, in, in just a uh, around a minute here. So it really starts with, so what's the problem or, or what's the knowing doing gap that your institution wants to address, whether it's a hospital or an outpatient clinic or home health? And you can use original research, syntheses of, of that original research, and products and tools resulting from this work, including clinical practice guidelines, algorithms, pathways, 
to inform how you're defining and, and uh, building context around that problem. And then the next step is really uh, after you find uh, knowledge uh, that can help you address your problem, adapting that knowledge to your local context. So to the resources that you have available to your patients and providers' values and preferences. Uh, assessing barriers to knowledge use and facilitators to knowledge use, and then implementing interventions that take into consideration those barriers and facilitators. And then once your intervention's implemented, knowledge, monitor how the knowledge is used and how outcomes change, and whether that use is sustained over time. And this inverted pyramid or this funnel can inform <coughs> each of these steps. So it's an example of, of you using evidence and evidence products to inform different stages of, of knowledge to action cycle. So why would large health court organizations and healthcare provider organizations want to do this? The good news is um, that uh, a lot of the work uh, that uh, you've heard um, uh, that CMS is doing around increasing access uh, also has a component of uh, increasing public reporting of, of clinician outcomes and paying clinicians and provider organizations more and more for the quality of, of the care that they deliver. So it's a real impetus for administrators and executives of these organizations to invest in, in the quality and safety of healthcare. And on, on the opposite end, you have stagnant reimbursements for care, uh, increasing costs of delivering care that cause administrators to think more about the value or the cost effectiveness of every dollar that's spent uh, on a patient's care. And so these, these forces really converge to support evidence-based practice, not just at the provider-patient level, but at a systems level. And so at the University of Pennsylvania, um, our uh, administrative and executive uh, leaders had the foresight and uh, invested in the Center for Evidence-Based Practice a number of years ago. We established this center back in 2006. And this is the mission of this center. It's to support quality, safety, and value of patient care at Penn through evidence-based practice. So our, our mission really is a, a, a Penn-focused mission. And Penn includes uh, four acute care hospitals. It includes rehab. It includes home care. Uh, it includes a hos inpatient hospice. And then tens and tens of outpatient <coughs> clinics across the Philadelphia region. So those are the <coughs> providers and patients that we're serving. And we accomplish this mission in a couple of different ways. We perform rapid reviews or rapid systematic reviews of the medical literature to help inform clinical practice, policy, purchasing, and formulary decisions um, in Penn, but also outside of Penn, and I'll talk a bit about that. We do translational work, um, particularly focusing on the integration of evidence into practice through computerized decision support. Uh, which Eric touched on a bit. And then offering education, evidence-based decision making to trainees, staff, and faculty. And we do this in and outside of, of Penn. And this is how we're organized. So um, our center is within our chief medical officer's office. And, and he's the chief medical officer for the, the entire health system. He reports up to the CEO. And there are many different departments and centers within this office of the CMO. Many of these are, are centers that you typically see in offices of the CMO. And, and uh, uh, we're one, just one of those centers. And our own group is a relatively small group. Um, I direct the center, uh, and one of my colleagues is a co-director. We're both uh, physicians who practice within the Penn Health System, and we both have formal training in clinical epidemiology. We have physician and nurse liaisons who represent our different hospitals uh, and different entities across our healthcare system. They identify uh, challenges or topics and bring them uh, to the center for discussion. They also disseminate uh, projects that we've done for other requesters back to the relevant audiences in their, in their home entities. 
We have research analysts who uh, do the, the bulk of the rapid systematic reviews. Uh, we have uh, consulting partners in biostats and, and uh, a health economist. And then unfortunately, it got cut off a bit, but we, have, we work with a, a number of clinical liaison librarians. Maylene Q is one of them, and, and Sherry Morgan got cut off. She's right under Maylene Q. But uh, Maylene and Sherry uh, serve in similar roles, but Maylene's role is the interface between the School of Medicine and the health system, and Sherry's role is the interface between um, the School of Nursing uh, and, and the health system. This is the basic framework we use to, to guide our practice. There's nothing revolutionary here. Defining the clinical issue, performing a systematic search for existing evidence, identifying or developing best practices, uh, working with different stakeholders to implement and monitoring the impact on select projects. So in terms of our rapid systematic reviews, I just want to give you a, a brief uh, look at um, some of the topics that uh, that we've done in the last number of months. So we do topics in all different domains, processes of care, we look at different devices, drugs, diagnostic tests. The formatting on some of these slides is off a bit, but uh, you'll still get the gist for processes of care. So one example that came to us uh, a number of months back, um, one of the nursing leads for a number of our surgical units asked us about gum chewing to promote bowel motility. Uh, there was uh, a relatively, there was a study that got decent press on uh, gum chewing and how it could restore bowel function after bowel surgeries and reduce length of stay. Um, and she asked us to, to look into this evidence base and there was actually a, a somewhat robust evidence base, uh, a number of RCTs done in the past looking at this. In terms of devices, uh, we recently did a review of, of automated hand hygiene monitoring systems uh, that our technology purchasing committee asked us to do. In terms of drugs, we don't do um, basic drug evaluations. Our pharmacists and our pharmacy and therapeutics committees deal with that, but we often uh, are asked to help uh, make decisions about taking drugs off of the formulary, which um, may be found to have adverse events, or adding drugs onto the formulary where there's a lot of pushback by PNT members, particularly around cost effectiveness. And so this is one example, intravenous acetaminophen. You know, a Tylenol tablet, which is acetaminophen, costs pennies. One dose of intravenous acetaminophen costs $15. So the question is, why would we need that on our formulary? Uh, and the, the argument was about um, using it in post-operative patients who were intubated uh, or couldn't swallow uh, post-operatively to reduce their need for opiates and other narcotics, which have a lot of uh, adverse effects. So we did a review on that. And diagnostic tests, one of the recent ones we did are uh, various screening tests to identify patients who are particularly high risk of aspiration. This just gives a breakdown of, of our first eight years, the types of uh, technology categories that, that we've evaluated. So about 50% of the rapid reviews that we do do look at best practice or process of care topics. About 30% look at drugs and another 20% look at devices or supplies. And these are the types of people who ask us to do these reviews. So a lot of uh, administrative and clinical leaders of clinical departments, uh, chief medical officers of the various entities across our health system, and there are probably about 15 CMOs across our health system. Uh, leaders of uh, purchasing committees, formulary committees, quality committees, and then nursing. Um, and particularly recently, we've we've developed some nice relationships with uh, the different uh, nursing infrastructures that are that are being redeveloped across the Penn system. So they've been um, a uh, frequent requester of reports over the last year or two. This just gives you some sense of how rapid these rapid reviews are. First first four years took us about 90 days from start to finish to do one of these. The last four years, it's been about two months. We, we do about 30 or so of these reports every year. 
Now, last summer we actually um, distributed our first survey of requesters uh, just to understand uh, what their interactions were like with our center, why they were using our center, what their satisfaction was with the rapid reviews that, that they had requested. And what we found was that most of the people requesting a report from our center uh, were really relying on our ability to identify and synthesize evidence. About half were relying on our objectivity, too. Meaning that uh, they respected the fact that we were part of the office of the CMO and not necessarily part of an individual clinical department which may have preconceived notions about the effectiveness of, of a given technology. Most said they conducted literature searches before contacting us. But as librarians, you know that probably many of those searches were basic Google searches. <laughs> so in terms of um, th this, this next slide is, is looking at uh, how our uh, survey respondents uh, felt about interactions with our center. Uh, the characteristics of our report, the, the impact of our reports, and their overall satisfaction with their experience. <coughs> and uh, this is Likert survey questions. All these questions uh, were answered on a scale of one to five, with five being the strongest agreement and one being strong disagreement. And so what you see here, I know it's a little tough to see, but this dark green is strong agreement, light green is agreement. This color that you can't see is neither agree nor disagree. And then the pink and the red are disagreeing or strongly disagreeing. And so what you see is that essentially for, for interaction questions, you know, did they find it easy to request a report, um, share the draft report, the expected time frame? Most people were very happy. They agreed or strongly agreed with those statements. Um, Probably the, the most interesting finding, at least from our perspective, was the impact of the report. So the, the report informed their final decision. And about 80% of people either strongly agreed or agreed with that. And then there were a number of people who neither agreed nor disagreed, and, and some uh, disagreed. So beyond our rapid reviews, we, we actually uh, do do some work with outside organizations in areas that are important to our health system. One of those areas is infection control and preventing healthcare acquired conditions in, in the patients uh, that we serve. So we've done some work with the CDC, uh, helping them co-author uh, infection control guidelines. And we're one of uh, the 13 ARC evidence-based practice centers. How many people, by a show of hands, have heard of the ARC EPCs before? Yeah, so you know, they're a good resource. They're essentially you know, the US government's resource for synthesizing evidence. And uh, different countries have different organizations that do this type of work. Canada has CADETH. Uh, the United Kingdom has NICE. Um, so we're one of these 13 centers. They're all across the country. And uh, they do uh, gold standard systematic reviews uh, on questions that are of important to different stakeholders in the healthcare community. And these reviews usually inform clinical practice guidelines for other forms of healthcare policy, including coverage decisions <coughs> by Medicare and others. I just want to point out that in, in uh, a number of these collaborations, our healthcare librarians have been uh, critical partners. And uh, these two guidelines that we wrote with the CDC, both uh, one of the co-authors was um, our former colleague Gretchen Kunz, who, who moved to uh, uh, to the University of Florida be closer with her parents, but uh, she was a uh, thoughtful and, and a thoughtful colleague and a major contributor to both of these efforts. In terms of dissemination implementation, all of our work is posted on our, our websites. We index a lot of these rapid reviews on the Health Technology Assessment Database, which is part of the, the Cochrane Library. And we publish a handful of these rapid reviews in peer-reviewed journals if they fill uh, major gaps in the evidence for which there are no other systematic reviews. And then a number of these reports have gone on to inform decision support. So what have the roles of the librarians uh, uh, been in our rapid review activity? So currently, um, 
our librarians uh, support search strategy development and reference management, particularly for our larger scale contract projects, and that includes the CDC and the ARC EPC work. They also serve as connectors between faculty, staff, trainees, um, uh, mostly through their development and maintenance of Vivo. How many people have heard of Vivo before? Great, yeah, this is commonly known in, in uh, audiences with medical librarians, but our medical librarians maintain our Vivo system, and it really allows us to find faculty and other staff who are well-versed in certain domains when we need to pull in those, those staff for, for collaborative projects. And then um, they serve as a liaison um, uh, between our center and the library for urgent and strategic database and reference needs. So if we really need a database maintained or we need the library to continue to invest in it, uh, they're one of our great advocates. Uh, and they help us with a lot of these glitches that pop up on a data day basis. So what are potential future roles? So, so our library and leadership, these are some potential future roles they're considering at Penn, and I'm sure uh, we're, we're not unique. Um, one of them is, is creating a systematic review core uh, where software can be, can be leveraged uh, to help faculty and staff and, and trainees uh, manage systematic review projects through software like Distiller develop searches, do title and abstract screenings through more novel software like Abstracker, uh, which uses machine learning technology to facilitate title abstract screening. Uh, procurement and management of full text, uh, developing data abstracting tools and evidence tables through systematic review data repository. And then developing partners with clinicians to enhance the yield of, of resource investment. So, so these are these are roles that our library is, is actively uh, considering at the moment. And this is just a, a screenshot of of our Penn Vivo page. You could you could type in a topic or faculty member up here and, and uh, find who's doing work in that area across Penn. So I want to shift now a bit into computerized clinical decision support, which is another uh, mode that we use to integrate evidence into institutional decision making. Uh, I think all of you know CDS provides clinicians or patients with knowledge and information filtered and presented to enhance patient care. It can be alerts, can be reminders about best practices, it can be order sets, but it could take a lot of other novel forms too. And, and usually the major limitation is the electronic health record software. It's not necessarily people's imaginations. This is a five rights model that's been created for decision support. And it's worth thinking about whenever you hear about a decision support intervention. To improve care outcomes, you provide the right information to the right stakeholder, whether it's a clinician or a patient, in the right format, through the right channel. It could be an EHR. It could also be a mobile device uh, or a, a, another web resource at the right point in the workflow to influence key decisions. These are some of the primary activities that, that our decision support work group at Penn is, is involved in. We do a lot of evaluation and prioritization of new decision support intervention proposals. We help develop and deploy those interventions, catalog and evaluate their effectiveness. These are the different types of people who are who are in our work group, physicians, nurses, pharmacies, regulatory affairs, and information services really refers to uh, information technology. Uh, this is a busy slide, but we do have a lead administrator for decision support who interacts with requesters of interventions, key stakeholders, our CDS work group, and IT analysts to uh, to build these interventions and a data analyst to ensure that we can understand its impact. Uh, so she's very busy. And this is just a sampling of a number of the intervention that interventions that they we've created over the years. And these have all been interventions that have been rolled out across the health system, usually addressing high priority areas. For good or for bad, those high high priority areas are often defined by uh, public publicly reported or pay for performance metrics. So, so the projects that we're working on are usually very similar or identical to projects that UIC is working on or U of C or, or, uh, or Georgetown or Vanderbilt or whatnot. 
So you could see uh, a couple examples here. And most of this is just improving the appropriateness of care, ensuring that people who need something to improve their health get it, and people who don't need something because it's going to harm them don't get it. <coughs> so I'll give you a few examples just to, uh, just to illustrate um, the value of decision support when it's done right. So one of the first projects that we worked on um, tried to improve uh, uh, giving medicine to prevent blood clots in the, in the legs and in the lungs. And as, as many of you know, patients who are admitted to the hospital, particularly orthopedic patients or older patients, patients with cancer, have a high risk of getting blood clots when they're in the hospital for many days. Uh, so there are many national guidelines that, that help let providers know who should be getting what and who shouldn't be getting something. And so we had a group that distilled all these guidelines. And unfortunately, it was 223 pages long, the document that they put together. So one of the ideas for disseminating this is just to make photocopies for all the clinicians. And that, no, that wasn't an idea. Um, the, the idea that, that really uh, uh, came to light pretty quickly was integrating this into the admission orders in our electronic health record. So that's what we did. I'm not going to go through the details of this, just to say that this is a screenshot of uh, our electronic health record when you're admitting a patient. And at the bottom here is a, a venous thromboembolism risk assessment. Uh, what's your patient's risk of having a blood clot? And as you scroll down, you could see that if you want to order pharmacologic prophylaxis, a list of different types of clinical services come up. And depending on what service you choose, the system will tell you what prophylaxis is most appropriate. And what you see here, just focusing on the black line, which is the health system as a whole, about 55% of people were getting blood clot prophylaxis before this intervention was launched. And then it jumped to about 80% uh, after this intervention was first launched. So one more example I want to show you um, is probably near and dear to many people's hearts. It's improving transitions of care for patients, particularly uh, reducing the likelihood that when you discharge a patient, they're going to come back in, in, in a couple weeks. No one thinks that's a good outcome. So one of the, uh, one of the major um, foundations of quality and patient safety at Penn is, is this blueprint for quality and patient safety, which everybody knows by heart. And it has these five imperatives. One is improving transitions. And part of this is identifying people at high risk for being readmitted. So what we were asked to do as a center is to, to um, make explicit what risk factors uh, exist uh, for a patient being readmitted to the hospital. And we did a rapid review. And basically what we found was there are two categories of risk factors. One was uh, attributes of the, of the patient themselves. Were they married? What kind of insurance did they have? What were their comorbidities? And then attributes of really how they utilized healthcare in the past. You know, did they have a lot of admissions to the ED, the hospital um, in the past? And based on this report, we looked in our electronic health record for what variables were, were available and valid and consistently there. And we developed a prediction rule, and we integrated it into our electronic health record. So what you see here, this is just a provider's list of patients. Each row is a patient. Uh, you don't see the patient's names. But there are about 25 patients here. And for some of these patients, they have risk flags which means that their chance of being readmitted within 30 days of discharge is, is about 30%. If they don't have a risk flag, it means their chance of being readmitted within 30 days of discharge is about 10%. So you might ask, so how is that risk flag used? So ideally, the way this risk flag would be used is um, nurses would do their follow-up phone call program, prioritizing patients who have flags, Pharmacists would do medication reconciliation at discharge, prioritizing those with flags. Uh, social work and clinical resource coordinators would, would get these patients uh, home services uh, over other patients without the flag. So those are ways that you could target uh, your initiatives to patients most in need. 
So decision support goes well beyond just the electronic health record. So one product that, that we um, invested in recently was a differential diagnosis generator called Visual DX. How many people have used Visual DX before? Okay. It's basically a way to, uh, for a clinician to build a differential around uh, what a rash might represent. And it's mostly about derma dermatologic conditions. So you can pick how acutely the rash developed, what type of rash is it, where is it on the body, some characteristics about uh, the patient and their age. And uh, this differential builder allows you to do that. So when I did that with a rash that my son had a couple years ago, this came up. Giannotti crosti, which is a rash that occurs after a viral illness. And that's what he actually ended up having. So the system helped me understand, you know, what exactly does he have and what's the prognosis? And so we looked at use of our system, uh, of the Visual DX system across our health system in the first, I think it was about 18 months uh, from launch. And this is tough to see here, but you're basically looking at number of uh, sessions <coughs> Uh, per month. So we're talking about, you know, four to six hundred per month. And the more recent data or last year has, has continued to be in the four to six hundred range. These bars represent um, the way in which somebody's using a Visual DX. So the bottom is mobile. So most people are using it on a mobile device, up to date, inpatient EHR, outpatient EHR, emergency department EHR. We also looked at how the use of Visual DX impacted uh, the ordering of inpatient dermatology consults. We thought it could go either way. People might order more consults because they get more information, or they might order fewer because the system gives them what they need. And basically what we found was dermatology consults at our flagship hospital were subtly increasing in the 12 months before, and they sort of continued to decrease, uh, increase in the, in the 18 months after. So there was really no change from the system. Now, there, there are clearly beyond a differential diagnosis uh, generator, there are other types of information uh, resource tools that are decision support. Many of those tools are, are summary tools, uh, like clinical guidelines, up-to-date Dynamed, and those are all integrated in our system as well. So this is, uh, this is up-to-date in a drop-down menu. We have many mobile resources available for, for our providers and trainees. And so currently, uh, what our librarians uh, do in this space is, is they work hard to understand clinician and trainee point-of-care resource needs. Uh, and they really uh, make investments, but also support uh, strategic investments by others in point-of-care resource needs. And they do a lot of education in these point-of-care resources. Now, there's there are, there's a lot in this space that they could they could contribute to in the future. And these are these three bullets are things that they're actively considering. So, developing closer partnerships with clinicians to enhance the yield of their resource investments with increases in subscription prices, with increases in the prices of single point of care resources, this is absolutely critical. And it's often really difficult for, for librarians to make these decisions. And it's difficult for non-specialists to make decisions about specialty databases. So having formal partnerships with clinicians to, to help prioritize these resources is key. And the same goes for patients and, and patient education materials. I think that's a fertile space and one that our librarians are just starting to, to explore. And that goes to some of Eric's points earlier about uh, how well, how good the materials are that we use in, in communicating what we want to communicate to our patients. And then supporting and developing uh, catalogs of evidence-based order sets and care pathways. So in the last minute or two, uh, I just want to highlight a couple educational efforts that our, our center is involved in. A lot of this is around teaching people about evidence-based quality improvement. Uh, we do critical appraisal uh, course uh, as part of a research certificate course, uh, a lot of workshops locally and nationally, um, systematic review education. And our librarians are involved in, in much of this work. So this is a critical appraisal course that we do 
where we give an intro lecture to EBM, a final lecture about shared decision making, and then all of the other uh, classes in between that first and last lecture are led by students critically appraising individual articles using JAMA user's guides. And as part of this course, we have a, a mandatory library session um, focusing on, on PubMed, um, uh, Cochrane, and National Guideline Clearinghouse for each of our students. Uh, I participate uh, every year in, in a course that's called Teaching Evidence Assimilation for Collaborative Healthcare, which is part of the New York Academy of Medicine. It takes place in every August in New York City. And what we do is teach evidence-based quality improvement. And one of the core faculty um, uh, in this group are medical librarians. Um, and uh, there are physicians there. There are um, nurses there. Uh, there are researchers there, pharmacists, administrators. So it's, it's really a nice opportunity for everyone to get together and, and learn about these processes. And then we, we do do a graduate course in systematic reviews. And, and um, uh, our library, Sherry Maylene, and, and one of our close colleagues, Eileen Aronoff, uh, do a, a three-day uh, series on literature searching. So there are a lot of uh, current and potential roles for, for our librarians uh, in the education space as well. Uh, and you, you see them here. So I'm just going to finish up. We'll, I'll go back to our case. So this actually came to one of our purchasing committees at Penn. And uh, the chair of the purchasing committee asked our center to evaluate the evidence on chlorhexidine versus betadine for reducing surgical site infections. And I think they were surprised when we came back and said, you know, there are many RCTs suggesting that chlorhexidine is a lot more effective. It reduced surgical site infections by about 25% as compared to betadine. Um, this is, this is uh, from a, a study we published. There were a lot more trials by the time we published this study, but even when we initially did the review, I think there were at least four randomized trials. And then we came back to them, and they said, well, OK, it may be effective, but it's probably not cost effective. And so we did a back of the envelope calculation for them. And, and basically what we found is that because surgical site infections can be so expensive, particularly for patients with cardiac surgery, if they get an infection of their sternum or, or mediastinum, these can be devastating infections for patients. So spending a little more money on a product that's a lot more effective, even if you're reducing one or two of these infections, can, save, can actually save the hospital money. And uh, we, we did a back of the envelope that suggested that the hospital could save about 400000 a year switching to chlorhexidine. So evidence-based decision making does impact quality, safety, and value of care delivered to patients. Uh, our center is one of, one of the few academically based centers in the US uh, with internal and external funding to do this type of work. Librarians are really close colleagues in all of the services that we provide. And uh, our center is always enthusiastic about collaborating in, in operations research or, or education. Um, in this space, I think that's I think that's all I have. So if you want to save questions until the end, okay. Thanks, everybody.